Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 13 of Talking About Horses. In these broadcasts, I try to bring you some of the best riders, horsemen, trainers, equine advocates, and thought leaders in the horse industry for tips, insights, and stories. You can listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle, either through Facebook, YouTube, or by downloading the podcast directly from the iTunes store. Today, I am pleased to, again, uh, be joined for a second time this season by my good friend, Wendy Murdoch. Wendy is an internationally recognized equestrian instructor and clinician for over 30 years, author of several books and DVDs, which I highly recommend, creator of Ride Like a Natural and the Surefoot Equine Stability Program. She's one of the most skillful teachers ever encountered in any equestrian discipline. Wendy's desire to understand the function of both horse and and human curiosity and love of teaching capitalizes on the most current learning theories in order to show riders how to exceed in their own expectations. Wendy, thank you once again for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me again. Oh, awesome, awesome. It's it's great to have you on here. We uh, you are the first person that we've had on here twice this season, and I believe we're booked for a third time later in the year too. Yeah, no, I, I have no idea what we're going to talk about then, but. <laughs> We'll come up with a topic, Patrick. We always do. Exactly. Yeah, we never have a problem talking. That's that's one thing we know for sure. <laughs> if we're booked, we'll be talking. We don't know what it's about, but we'll be talking. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get questions from people, and we can actually do a Q and A kind of kind of thing if we can get people to to tell us some of the things they we, they would like to hear us talk about. I think that would be awesome. I think that would be great. We can do a little promo ahead of time. Give folks a couple weeks to come up with questions or something. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, very yep. cool, very cool. So today we want to talk a little bit about uh, the Surefoot Equine Stability Program, and this is something that you have been talking about for, what, a couple years now? Five, over five years. Five years now already, wow. Well, yeah, I know, okay, I guess five. I yeah. remember you and I, I think we're having sushi at an expo, uh, maybe about four or five years ago, and you were showing me some video footage when you were first uh, first discovering this stuff? Yeah, I don't remember that, but then it's totally possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sushi and sake and, you know, and sure late nights after yeah, all expos. The essence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's great. I, I remember it was before you got the new current pads and you were talking about how you weren't completely sure what it was that you were accessing with the horses through the use of the pads yeah and five years later we we're still not sure but <laughs> the, we have so much information now um through five years of experience and actually with people all around the world using Surefoot and emailing me and calling me and writing me and telling me amazing stories about the changes in their horses. And so, you know, I've talked to many people about how we can get some science behind it, but in the end, it's so profound to the horses that it really doesn't matter because if you see a horse on the pad and the changes in the horse, you become a believer because you see it with your own eyes. You see the horse change. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, I mean, I'd love to get the research because, you know, I'm a scientist by training. Right. I've got a master's degree and I would love to have the science behind it. But in the end, you know, it's the application of the process and the changes in the horses that are so profound and so amazing that, um, you know, someday we'll get that science. Because I've actually um, I spent uh, three hours a couple of about a month or so ago with Dr. Hillary Clayton and Dr. Bob Belker. Um, Dr. Clayton uh, was a professor at MSU. She's now retired. And Dr. Balco is still at MSU. And he um, he is studying horses' feet and the sensors in the horses' feet. So he's actually a neuroscientist. Bob Belker is one of the first people I contacted when I first discovered Surefoot. And I, I called him up because I knew that he was studying horses' feet. And I was like, Bob, what do you think is going on? And at the time, he sent me two chapters of a book that I don't think he's published, but it was all about horse, the foot. And he talked about the, the hoof is a sensory organ. And, you know, when I've been going around the world now and doing um, lectures and demos and trainings with Surefoot working. I just came back from Europe where I did 
three workshops for physical therapists. So I'm actually working with the physical therapist and training them how to use surefoot in their practice. And when I tell people that the hoof is a sensory organ, it's kind of like, uh, oh, you know, we, we haven't really thought about it that way. We yeah. think about it as, you know, just something the horse, you know, it needs to be trimmed. It's a toenail. Um, but the fact is that the horse picks up so much information about his world through his feet and is so dependent on making a good connection with his feet to the ground that we're, we're just putting all this information, like think uploading a ton of information to the horse's brain through that foot, through all these sensors that are in the foot. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, talking with Bob, um, we sat there and tried to come up with some studies that are, you know, we're trying to come up with studies that are non-invasive and that would be something we could do as a pilot to get to, to but have good science. Cause you can do quasi science, but sure. you know, like we really, if, if we do study this, we want to do really good science, peer reviewed, something that can stand up to the test of scientific study. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but, you know, like talking to Bob and in my lectures now, I talk about the fact that there are these different receptors in the foot. There's Ruffini receptors and Pacinian receptors. There's proprioceptors. There's, um, you know, um, what was the latest one? He just told, sent me another paper. I can't remember off the top of my head. But what these sensors do is give the horse's brain information about pressure, temperature, pain, vibration, um, and so the horse is picking up all this information that we tend to not even consider. Right. Um, and, and so Surefoot is working through these various receptors and also the parasympathetic nervous system, which is so clearly evidenced by the reaction of the horse, the lick and chew, the lowering the head. But, you know, I think probably what we need to do is back up and kind of let me explain a little bit about Surefoot and how I got here five years later for people that have never heard about it. I think that would be great. And then I want to touch base with you on the receptors that you mentioned also. But Absolutely. So, so I Make always give, there. you know, I carry around a, a set of your pads. Uh, and actually, I've left them in Kentucky with a friend of mine who's got a horse that's working through some confidence and some body awareness things. And I said, look, this horse needs them more than I do right now, so you hang on to them until the next time I get to visit with you. So so they're out on loan right now. Um, great. And uh, it, it's they're, they're just great. Um, they're, <laughs> it, it, I joke that I don't know how to explain what it is uh, that's happening, but the horses say that it's real, so it's real. And I tell everybody... When I pull them out, I say, look, I know I've pulled some wacky things and asked you to do some strange <laughs> things in the past, so you can roll your eyes all you want, but look, we're going to try this. And it, it's so funny because I tell everybody that when you first introduce them, and I've said this to you, so I'm not afraid to say this. When you first introduced them, I thought, what kind of hokey crap is this, you know? And then I thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about all of this stuff, about anything when it comes to new products for the horses and things like that, because, you know, how many new things are there under the sun? But oh, yeah. the only person that I think I can think of that is more skeptical than I am is you. <laughs> It's funny because I had this conversation with myself in my head, you know? I thought yeah. the only person I know more skeptical than I am is Wendy. And, well, hell, if she says there's something to it, there's probably something to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, you know, I, I mean, I don't blame anybody for being skeptical because it just – it seems so peculiar. And, and yet, like I said, when you see a horse on the pads and the response of the horse – you you realize it's real and um i don't know were we up at were you at equine affair it was several years ago now um when i was first introducing the first time i introduced surefoot at equine affair in massachusetts um i had a different demo i was doing my five minute fixes demo and this horse named fluffy came in the arena and little chink fatigue pony cute as a button but they put the roll down door down and the horse got really upset and the owner was great, and she was trying to do some groundwork to calm the horse down, but Fluffy was not calming down. So I grabbed a pad, and I walked over to her, and I said, do you mind if I take your horse? And so she said, sure. And she handed me the horse, and I lifted the foot. I set the pad on the ground. I put the foot down on the ground. I had 300 people in the audience. In under 10 seconds, probably more like three, the horse completely relaxed, dropped its neck, and, and totally quieted down. 
Wow. And I, you know, I could feel the whole audience go, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> and so she then, hypnotized him. <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I walked out with this weird little pad and then I did a little bit more. I put the rider back on. I did it a couple more times. So when I say I did it a couple more times, the horse stands on the pad and then you let it go for a walk. You never force it to stay on the pad. It's always the horse's choice. So I just let the horse walk off. And I did that a few times. And then I went to do my demo, which is the five minute fixes. And as I'm doing my demo, Fluffy went over to the railing where the pad was, pawed the pad out from the railing got one foot on it, and then finally managed to get both front feet on the pad. I remember seeing the photos of that. Yep. It brought yes. the house down. Yeah. It was just like, you know, because clearly it was so profound to the horse that the horse wanted to get back there. Absolutely. And, you know, there was no denying it. Because I'm busy. I'm trying to do other things. Well, nobody paid attention to me. <laughs> um, you know, because Fluffy just stole the show. Right. And, exactly. And and everybody came up to me and said, I saw that horse. I saw that horse on the patch. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's what's so incredible. And, you know, in this process of five years and in, in um, I, I don't know how many horses now I put on pads and how many other people have done it as well. One of the things that keeps coming back to me over and over is that the horses are just waiting for us to say something to them in a way that is meaningful to them. And there's something about the pads that is so meaningful to these horses that they give us instant, yes, instant feedback and show us that, wow, this, this helps them. This helps them calm down. It helps them be you know, more confident. It helps them be better citizens. It helps them be more interactive with their owners. Um, and it's, and even if we can't explain it, it doesn't matter. It's obvious that it it's meaningful to the horses. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm, I, it, I'm, and my life changed in 10 seconds when I put the first pad underneath the horse's foot. And five years later, plus five years plus, you know, I, I am still as, as committed to bringing this to the horse world as I was on that first day, because it is so meaningful to the horses. Absolutely. I, I think that's yeah. awesome. And and you know what a nerd I am. So I'm, of course, taking yeah. notes as we talk. And I'm, I'm absolutely geeking out and loving what you just said, as uh, the horses are just waiting for us to say something in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love the whole idea behind that. And that's one of the, the key premises with Surefoot. And, and, you know, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner. I think we talked about what Feldenkrais method is the last time. Mm -hmm. And Feldenkrais is about uh, achieving our own potential and discovering self through self-awareness, discovering what our potential is. And so it's from this Feldenkrais perspective that I came up with Surefoot. And it's really about helping the horse achieve their potential and um, giving them the sense of grounded connectedness to the earth that they need to be confident, to be relaxed, to perform better. Because in the end, no matter how big that horse is, all he gets are those four hooves. And how those four hooves meet the ground is going to determine his balance, his security, his reaction to things, his ability to observe rather than react and run away. Because that's, he's perceiving his world not only through his eyes, but through his feet. And if he turns his 40-pound head, if you take a 1,000-pound horse, their head weighs 40 pounds, he turns his 40-pound head and leans through his shoulder, he's falling. And so yeah. the horse is reacting. And then we get upset because, wow, my horse is not listening to me. But really the horse is falling out of balance. And then he's going to get upset just like a person would when they're out of balance. And we tend sure. to blame um, things like the horse is being resistant or he's being difficult on behavior. But what I keep discovering is it's a balance problem. The horse is not solid and secure to the ground. So he turns his head, he shifts his weight, then a noise startles him. And the next thing he's going, not because he wanted to, to do that, but because he didn't have a choice. He couldn't reorganize to be balanced over his four feet to be able to simply observe, evaluate, and assess, and then decide that it's okay. Instead, he's shifted his body weight. He's shifted his weight forward. He's now starting to move. He has to move a foot. And the next thing you know, you know, he's either 
doing something that we consider disrespectful, that word makes me crazy, right. um, or, you know, disobedient or whatever. And really, he, it wasn't his intention, but it was what happened. And then it just becomes an escalation and, and something of a, like an avalanche, Snowball. basically. He's rolling downhill yeah. trying to catch himself, but can't catch himself because he's rolling downhill. Yeah. And so, you know, this is where um, I just did a, a a thing with Callie King at CRK Training. Oh, did and, you? Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I was just at Phil filming for two days because we, we filmed a new course. And it's, oh, right. You um, said you're in Pennsylvania right now. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, the ABCs of, the, of to, on the AIDS. And one of the things that I started realizing is to help people understand what needs to happen is I, I draw a pie chart and there's, you know, the feet, the teeth, the back, the saddle, the rider and nutrition. And if mm. one of these pieces is out of balance, it's going to put the, the system out of balance. Now, some horses can be insulted in certain areas and still have enough strength in others that they can be okay. But if the horse isn't able to um, recover, he's not going to be healthy. And so if the horse is not in balance on his feet and he can't recover that balance, then he's going to have to react just like you would. Sure. So what Surefoot does is it brings the horse's awareness to his feet and to the way his feet are meeting the ground. And the pads give to weight and pressure, and there's some that are more stable than others. I'll get into that in a minute. Okay. But um, they give to the horse's weight. And you'll see the horses not only visibly soften in their face, you'll see breathing changes in under 10 seconds, you'll see relaxation of the facial muscles, you'll see the neck lowering, breathing changes, the horses will start to close their eyes, they'll sway, they'll rock, they breathe, they sigh, and you can see them visibly softening and grounding and then exploring their weight distribution over their four feet, mm -hmm. and literally experimenting and shifting and and playing with it in a way that's obviously experimentation now not every horse goes through this process that i've just described or goes through it they all go through it in different timing different number of days different number uh, amount of minutes on the pads mm -hmm. but that's the consistent pattern that we see and while this is happening, there's clearly firing all these receptors in the feet, the proprioceptors in the joints, the Ruffini receptors, and then the parasympathetic system, which is evidenced by this, you know, the licking and chewing, sighing, breathing, yawning. Um, what I tell people is horses only have so many ways of telling us when they're relaxing. So whether it's acupuncture, massage, um, you know, um, you know, whatever these modalities are that we use on the horse, he, he only has so many ways of ex expressing relaxation. Right. And so we see these same signs when we use surefoot. The difference is how we got there. We got there by picking up the horse's foot and putting it on an unstable surface. And so that's really the cool thing about surefoot is the simplicity of it and the fact that any owner can do this with their horse well, just with, you know, given some, you know, basic information that comes with it um, so that they can actually interact with their horse and help their horse rather than always having to either hire a professional or, you know, um, ha have to do a lot of something else. Um, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense to me anyway. And, and maybe part of that is because I've experienced the Surefoot pads. So I'm going to I'm going to take you back a minute, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. You were talking about the feet, the teeth, the back, the rider and nutrition, right? Were the, and was saddle. that the five? Saddle, and the saddle. Saddles and in the their saddle. Yeah. OK, so there's six, six things to that. OK. All right. And, and what did you call those? Um, the, uh... <laughs> you said it was on a pie chart. Yeah, I draw a pie chart, and it's like, um, you know, uh, what do I call that pie chart? I just had a brain blank. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. No, Everyone's just listening live now with bated breath. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I just think of it as a holistic approach that we have to look at all these different factors in order to have that healthy horse. Gotcha. Um, and some horses can have 
you know, some horses can deal with their feet being a bit out of balance because they're so strong, say, in their back or they're so strong in their in their general well-being. Um, other horses, the princess and the pea factor, you know, their foot's a tiny bit out of balance and they just can't handle it. Um, same with saddles. So when I look at a horse, I look at these different factors and think about, okay, there's certain ones that I can control as an instructor, and they're all something under my control as an owner. Um, sometimes I might need assistance with those different things in the chart, but they all need to be addressed in order to make sure that this horse is healthy to be able to do what I want. So if a horse has really bad teeth, it's not only going to affect his teeth, it's going to affect his contact, it's going to yes. affect his jaw, it's going to affect his back, it's going to affect his feet, it's going to go through you know, that can go through the whole system and set up a pattern that is counterproductive to what I want to do with my horse. So if you were to put the bridle into those factors, you'd put those in with the teeth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because how the bit fits, whether or not the horse is comfortable with that particular bit, um, you know, all of that in with the teeth, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Because like I said, of course, I'm taking notes as we go about this. <laughs> yep, yep, that's fine. You know, so what we did with Callie is we took a horse and we moved it on the lunge line. I put dots on it. We moved it on the lunge line and I talked about what I saw happening in the horse. And then we talked about, all right, if we wanted to get this horse on the aids, what are the factors that have been addressed with this horse? Okay, it's had had its teeth taken care of. Its feet are in good shape. We're working on the saddle. And some things are things that you can address, you know, in the short term. You can get somebody out to do the teeth fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Other things like the feet, if it's a big change you have to make, it's going to take several trimmings or shoeings. And saddle fit is uh, sort of an you have to ongoing check in to make sure, you know, because as you change the feet, it's going to change the back. As you change the teeth, it's going to change the back. So some of these things you have to, like, check back on and make sure that everything's okay you know three months six months nine months um depending on how rapidly other things are changing and then obviously you know with nutrition horses get fat they get thin the grass grows suddenly we have a drought um mm -hmm. you know it's, it's staying on top of that to make sure that everything is working forward toward that horse being healthy and able to be a good student you know, I mean, it's just like children. If they're if they go to school hungry or they haven't had a good night's sleep, they're not going to be a good student. And exactly. that's the same in the horse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've got to set them up for the positive learning for sure. Absolutely. And so this is where Surefoot plays into this picture, in that if the horse isn't balanced, and this is where you have to realize that horses have habits just like people. Yes. So, um, excuse me a sec. <coughs> so. You know, if a horse has had bad teeth or it's had poor shoeing or it got kicked in the field or something like that, it's going to affect the way it moves. And depending on how long that habit pattern has been there, will it'll affect the way that horse moves and the way a horse responds to things. So, you know, like when people drive a car, they have a habit of how they sit in a car. They have one foot more forward, the arms on the arm rest, you know, they drive just with one hand and they sit kind of crooked through their ribs. And then they get on the horse and they think they're going to be perfectly square, you know? So horses have habits just like that. And they don't necessarily have to be associated with a, an acute problem or a pain problem in the present moment. It could have been something in the past, altered the horse's movement pattern, carry that forward even when the injury is recovered or the insult is removed. But now that's become a predominant pattern in the horse. And until we address that habit pattern, it's going to keep going, just like in people. Since the horse stands on only those four little feet, we're going to see those body patterns in the way the horse stands. So if he's, you know, really stiff in the ribs and he kind of leans over on the right all the time and you wonder why you can't turn left because he's leaning to the right, it's going to show up in the way he stands on the pads. But the cool thing is that while he's on the surefoot pads, he starts exploring his balance, and he and he becomes self-aware, and that's what I love about this is the horse, you can literally see them become self-aware and explore how they're standing on the pad. And obviously, you start with one foot, and then when he walks off, which the whole point is stand on the pad for a little while and then go back to the earth, 
he walks off and you can literally feel them thinking about how that foot is hitting the ground. Yes. You know, their awareness is now brought to, and you can feel them going. And some of them will walk off like they're on eggshells. Others will just march right off and stride right out. I've seen horses revert to old patterns for 20 minutes that they had when they were lame and then completely let it go. Um, I've seen horses that just, that were rushing, that completely stopped rushing or horses that were stuck, that start to move. I mean, it's, it's so, so fascinating because each horse is so unique and yet the way we get there is bringing that awareness to that horse through the surefoot pads. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they get to think about their body in a totally unique way. Yeah. Because, you know, pretty much everything else we do, we impose on the horse and it's training. And that doesn't mean negatively. I mean, there's a lot of really good training, you know, when I need you, you stay behind me, but we're imposing our desire on what a good horse is onto the horse, you know, how we want him to behave, Mm -hmm. how we want him to move, what we want him to do, how we want him to interact. And with Surefoot, we're saying, what do you want? You know, would you like this density or would you like this one? Right. You know, would you like to stand on it with your right front? Oh, no, maybe your left front. Or how about a hind leg? Do you want to stand on it for two seconds? No problem. You want to stand on it for 15 minutes? Well, now I have to be the adult and say, if you're swaying like crazy, maybe only five minutes because you're working all those little postural muscles. Mm -hmm. Um, But in that way, we're letting the horse show us what is what they want and it's so interesting because there are horses that uh, I had a woman come up to me recently. She said, my horse stands on the pads every day. When I groom her, she picks up her feet for me to put on the pads. This has been going on for a year, but she only wants it underneath the right side. She does not want the pads on the left. I'm like, fine. You know, she gets to choose. She gets Mm -hmm. to show you. I have other people say, you know, my horse only wants the pads like every you know, a few months, but he stopped twisting his hocks and he's 30 years old. Whoa. And that's all we did different. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I have uh, another horse. He's a school horse. The pads are piled up in the corner of the arena. They put the student on. He goes over to the pile of pads. He shows them which foot he wants on a pad. He stands on the pad for a while and you can visibly see him relax. And then he goes off and he's happy to give the lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, you know, and performance horses, this is going to help them, um, you know, be more relaxed because a relaxed horse is going to train better. It's going to help them cool out after work. Right. Um, you know, horses that have difficulty standing being tacked up or standing to be mounted, you use surefoot and suddenly they're grounded and they can stand to be tacked up and stand to be grounded, uh, mounted. Right. I mean, there's right. so many ways that you can use this in a program and, you know, with any horse. It's right. really quite Absolutely. And I think I was telling you about the horses that I had had because last last January, February, I had some some training horses in uh, in Ohio before we moved to Virginia. And I had one horse. We were working significantly on engagement and, you know, proper use of his body under saddle. And he would stand while he was being groomed and tacked. I, I would put them under his front feet and he would stand with them under his front feet for a few minutes and then he would actively push them to his hind feet and stand on them with his hind feet. Yeah, it sounds like you need four pads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. I mean, they'll they'll show you what they want and they'll, um, who is it? I just had a person email me uh, from over in Europe and her horse, I don't know, she had a problem with the canter and now the horse is cantering beautifully. Um Horses that are recovering from EPM, one woman had a horse and it was a dressage horse and after EPM, it couldn't do lateral work. She used surefoot and it was back to showing second level. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, I have, there's so many stories and, and what I'm trying to do right now is um, over in Europe, I've done three, three or four workshops for professionals, for physiotherapists and chiropractors and, um, and trainers and they're starting to build case studies so that we can um, sort of collect a body of knowledge. And when mm. people say, well, you know, does this work on a horse with shivers? Well, I actually have one case where the woman used the, the pads to help the horse to be shod that had shivers, and it made a difference. It made it easier for the horse to be shod. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and there's uh, trailer loading. One woman, her horse was really 
didn't like to go in the trailer. And so she started using Surefoot in front of the trailer. And the next thing, the horse walked in the trailer all by himself. Wow. Totally I know I've, I've been doing the same thing. I'll, I'll use it outside the trailer. And then for yep. the horses that I've found to be really anxious in the trailer, I'll put the pads inside the trailer. Oh, really? And, yeah. And that, I mean, right now, once I've introduced them first, of course, but right, 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 right. now it, it brings the anxiety level right down. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. With the ones so, I've tried it on, of course. I can't say that it would work on all of them, but with all of the no. ones that I've personally tried it on, it has worked. Well, and that's the thing is there isn't any one thing that works for every horse. Right. And I have seen some horses that absolutely, um, well, two things, are just totally uninterested. But those horses, typically, you'll find they're really grounded. They're really secure. They really know where their feet are. And so they're like, ho-hum, you know, why are you doing this? Yes. Um, and actually, um, do you know who Larry Weitzel is? I do, absolutely. Yeah. So he's he's a really good gated horse trainer. Yes. And he had a nervous horse, and so he bought a bunch of pads, and I shipped him out. He sent me an email, and it, and it's one that I, I – um, I just think about all the time. He said, the horses that really need it want it. And the horses that don't need it aren't that interested. And I realized he was totally right. Yes, that's very true. Um, Yep. And so the other horses that um, don't like it are horses that are neurological. Like if you're already unsteady. I remember you saying that. Yeah, the the body can't handle it or the brain can't handle it. Right, because you're already unsteady. However, <laughs> I recently had um, Brynja Rydell is my person over in Germany, and she had a client that had a really neurological horse, and she went out and she put the horse on on firm pads, and when it walked off, it was so wonky. It was like, wow, this is like – but we said, well, let's go back and get a video of that because people need to see what happens when a neurological horse stands on the pads and how it's not going to work for them. Mm-hmm. So she went back like a few weeks later, put the horse on pad, walked it off. It was totally fine. So, really? uh-huh. I mean, it blew both of us away and we're like, oh, darn, we, now we don't have that great video. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next horse. <laughs> yeah. But they, you know, they'd done the pads and she'd then put it, after she put it on the firm pads, she used what we call the impression pad, which is the most stable pad. It own, it gives to heat and pressure, but it's not unstable. It, the horses don't wiggle around on it. Gotcha. And um, that's what she used with that horse, and clearly something changed. Um, so I actually had another horse I used the impression pads with, and it was a thoroughbred that was super unstable. You know, it was like, which leg are you laying in? I can't really tell. Um, and we uh, used the impression pads. It only wanted the impression pads underneath its back feet, and we let it stand there for about five minutes or so. And then I saw the horse in the afternoon because it was a demo over at Equitana in Essen, Germany with Linda Tellington Jones. Okay. So in the afternoon, I went back down and the horse's pelvis was level and it wanted other different densities. And um, that woman, the woman that owned that horse actually has become a huge fan of Surefoot because she's just seen amazing changes, not only in that horse, but in a lot of other horses. It turns out she's a physical therapist. I didn't ah, even realize. interesting. Yeah. Okay. So she's like totally hooked and has really been using it her practice a lot. Yeah. yeah. So how did you discover the Surefoot pads? Yeah. So um, it was May five years ago, and I had a client that I used to teach at Morven Park. And at Morven, I would go two days a month. I would go Monday and Tuesday every month, once a month to teach. And so a lot of the clients would come the Monday and then the Tuesday. So I went on the Monday and one of my clients, she's been with me for over three years at that point. Um, her horse, when we first started three years prior was lame and I just used a lot of Feldenkrais and body work on the horse and we got him going and he was competing. She got eights in harmony and dressage. She was doing great. And then she wanted a jumping saddle. So she, she, um, got one on loan, rode in it during the month prior to when I saw her in May. And the farrier also quit the horse. Um, And so when I saw him, he was under saddle again, but he was lame in the right hind leg. And I said, well, let me look at the saddle. And the saddle was crooked. It was putting more pressure on the right rear corner. So I said, do you have your other saddle? She said, yes. We put that back on and he was better, but he was still not right. 
So that night I went home and I was talking to Dr. Joyce Harmon on the telephone because she's my best friend and my horse actually lives at her house. Um, mm. And I was talking to Joyce. Joyce knew this horse. She had been a client of hers as well. And while we were on the phone, she was talking about wanting to stand at a computer instead of sit because, you know, insulin resistance and the whole idea that standing is better for you. And she said, but, you know, I want a pad to stand on. And so and then she started telling me how they've been putting dogs on pads for uh, physical uh, rehabilitation, like, um, you know, for stability training. And so while she's telling me this, I was on my computer and I'm tapping this in and I'm looking at dogs standing on all these different surfaces. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if anybody's done that with a horse. And she said, not, not that I know of. And she said, and then I talked to her about this particular horse, Dante. And um, she said, well, you know, let, why don't I give it a try? She's like, sure. And she said, just time it for 10 seconds. So, so don't have them stand on the pad any longer than 10 seconds. I'm like, okay. So I grabbed whatever I had in my shed and I drove to the lesson and I walked up to my client and like your clients, like, I'm going to do this weird thing. Okay. Oh yeah, sure. Whatever. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> they know me, you know, it's what weird thing is Wendy got this time. Right, exactly. Exactly. And I, yep. And I, I go over to his right hind foot. I pick it up. I put the pad under his foot. I put his foot down on the pad. I time it for 10 seconds. And when he walked off, he was completely different in 10 seconds and I was blown away so I worked with him for the the hour and by the time we got done the horse was sound he was fine um the next horse that came in for a lesson was a quarter horse that had done western pleasure the owner wanted to do a venting um he had the little you know short choppy canner um so I worked with the pads with him and within the hour we had this lovely round canner um, the next horse was a halflinger, and it was a really good friend of mine, Catherine Wyckoff, who is also a Feldenkrais practitioner, and a, she's got a PhD in physical therapy, and she's a very talented person. Um, and so I was like, you know, I'm going to do this weird thing with your horse, and put the pads underneath them. And we had a round canner out of this. He's a really short, short little halflinger, and suddenly he was just lovely. Um, she's actually been using the pads with that horse. His name is Andy ever since then and so that's one of the things to realize is that surefoot's not just a one-off thing right. it's like different things happen with the horse or he's gone through a different phase in his life and he wants the pads again and so she uses them on a regular basis with him over the past five years um but by this point i was like completely hooked um and you know have started calling up my friends and had dressed those horses. Can I come over and put pads on their horses? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went out to Washington State, and I didn't take what I had with me, and I got out there, and I looked at these horses, and I thought, oh, I want to put pads under their feet. And one of the people was a physical therapist, so she had some things that we could use and, um, you know, started doing that. And then my next trip was I went from Washington State over to Holland, and by now I'm like, okay, we got to video this. We <laughs> Mm, yeah. just like you know and so that's when I, I mean it just rolled from there um and the the things that i was using at the time were designed for people and the problem with putting horses on stuff designed for people is they um they can lose their air like valves get broken and they hiss or you know they break or they tear you know right. i mean you're you're putting a thousand fifteen hundred pound creature on on a surface right um, with potentially sharp edges on their hooves and all that stuff absolutely um and steel shoes and stuff like that and um so a after i destroyed i don't know how many pads and brad was my husband brad was watching me go through things like butter um i'm like i need something more durable and <laughs> so <laughs> that's when he's an engineer so he you know, went to the internet and started researching companies and he found a company we work with in, that's in, in up in Maine and we, they're great people and they have been worked with us and they would send us prototypes and I would, you know, it would take like a few months to get a prototype and in five seconds I'd test it and go, nope, try again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it took us like a year and a half to come up with something that was going to be durable but also have the same effect and that's really um you know the thing is 
um, the pads we have now, they'll get nicked and torn, but they're not going to break. They just won't look as pretty, you know, they right. can get kind of right, but they, they work and, and we have them warranted. And, and, um, so that was the goal is to come up with a horse durable pad that still produced the same effect as what I was using before. Um, but that, you know, would have a longer, much longer life. And yes. that's what we've succeeded in doing. Um, and they're better shaped, they're easier to use, they're lighter mm-hmm. weight, they stack, um, you know, so they're, right. you know, you just wash them with soap so they're and water. they generally and, handier. I, and I know I've had mine out in some severe cold weather, and, and I know in the, in the very cold, um, I've had mine crack, uh, the paint, basically, the, the rubber coating on top right. of the paint has cracked, but it hasn't affected the usability of the pads whatsoever. Uh, Correct. They just and look like I they went people, through a world war, but they're still exactly. just as useful as brand new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I tell them, you know, below like 45, just flip them up. You can use both sides of the pad. Right, So right. in colder temperatures, you just flip them over and use the, the direct foam surface mm-hmm. because of that. Because that, that little white line that you see that has the colored coating, mm-hmm. it's, it's a slightly stiffer material, so it diffuses the weight of the horse over more surface area. So that way, with each pad, you get two different working surfaces. Mm, gotcha. But, you know, obviously in the extreme cold, you've got to flip if you flip yes. it over otherwise it's just you know it's just not as pretty as what i tell people um <laughs> right. right mine are but, pretty ugly but they're yes, they're pretty useful all the same so and i know right. chatting with with you and brad over dinner uh when was it equine affair this past year in columbus yeah in april uh, yep. yeah i think i learned more about foam and rubber and paint <laughs> and plastic and shipping and fabrication than i never wanted to know <laughs> I get it. I told totally, you, look, you know, I had no idea when I put that pad under a horse's foot that I would become a manufacturer of something. Right. Okay. <laughs> and it's a completely different world. Um, and you know, I mean, supply and everything. So, um, and, but the other thing that's so much fun is that we keep experimenting with new products and new ideas. Um, cause somebody will go, you know, well, that was great, but can you do blah, blah, blah. And we're like, well, Let's see. So Right. Yeah, um, because you've already got the ball rolling, so what's one more experiment? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So we wound up we have um the basic product line has five different pads. There's the impression pad, which is the it when it's cold, it'll feel like a brick. But it gives to heat and pressure. So like I was at twenty two degrees with an Icelandic that bolted and I used the impression pad and again it's gonna give slowly but you watch their horses just kind of melt into that pad. So uh-huh. it, it uh, going back to these receptors that we talked about way back mm-hmm. in the beginning, mm-hmm. as they stand on it and the pad gives, they get sole contact. And so now we're affecting all those Ruffini receptors in the sole of the foot. And you'll the pad is going to give, so if the foot isn't totally balanced or if there's a lot of pressure in some area, the pad will give, so it starts to normalize the pressure over the whole foot. And you just watch these horses visibly, you know, slowly melt into the pad. So um, that's a great pad for horses that are unstable, for anxious horses, nervous horses. And it's the one that I I, I keep going back to. Like, I forget about it, and then I go back and go, wow, why don't I use this more often? Uh Um, Yeah, it's a really interesting interesting pad. Um, I have some people in Europe that are saying that it's great for trauma release, that they find that animals that have been traumatized, like, so we set up all the different pads in this, at this physiotherapy place in Switzerland. And we had this cat that was walking over the pads and, and it was like walking all around. It would kind of stand on all the other ones. And then it went and it laid down on the impression pad. And I thought, well, that's really interesting mm. because that's the, the hardest one. Yeah. And then, and then the woman told me that the cat had had a traumatic experience. I was like, wow, that's really weird. Interesting. So there's people in in Europe using that for trauma release, which I find fascinating. Um, The firm pad is the one you have with the green top and the charcoal. Yes. It has give, so and it has some springiness, but it's fairly stable. Um, The medium is the purple pad. It's quite springy, so I don't start with that one typically. Um, But if I have a horse that's like really flat to the ground, doesn't kind of come off the ground very quickly or kind of just a a flat attitude, I really like that one. And that's the one people like the most. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay. 
Yeah, overall, people like the, the purple one the best. Um, it's springy. It makes you feel, you know, it gives you an upward feeling versus the others which absorb. Uh, um, okay. Right? Like the soft, you stand on the soft and it really gives. And horses that are sore on their feet um, or flat sold and that sort of thing, oh, you can just see they just love the soft. Mm, they just melt um, into it. Yep. And then the slant is an angled pad, so it's a, a, a wedge. And I use that typically heel high, and I'm changing the angles in the joints in the horse when I use the slants. And you can use it heel high or heel low, but either way, it's, you know, that's what I'm looking for there is to make a slight change in the angles in the joints. And every, you know, all the joints have proprioceptors, so you're making little changes to those, to that proprioception. Right. Um, right. And then I don't think you've seen the, have you seen the farrier pad? Yes, well, I think you were just yeah. releasing them in, in Columbus at Equine Affair. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so. I have seen that. They're the orange pads, yeah? Yeah, they're they're bigger. They're 24 by, by um, 14, but they're only an inch and a half thick. Mm -hmm. And it's an inch of impression material and a half inch of medium. So you have two different surfaces on that pad. Okay. Um, and we've renamed it the physio pad rather than the farrier pad because we have physical therapists, putting horses on that pad during treatment. Um, we've had horses, and, and this is one of the things that's really fascinating. So I have several reports now of horses that have been colicking, and they, they you know, I always tell people, call your vet first. But right. then, you know, you can put the horse on the pads, and in some cases it has alleviated completely or um, decreased the intensity of the colic. Which is rather counterintuitive when we're always told walk the horses when they're colicking. Right. Now, you know, I'll, obviously if the horse needs to walk, that's fine. But if mm -hmm. he can stand quietly, um, what I have seen is by putting him on the pads, we're clearly affecting all those receptors and yes. firing all those neurochemicals in the brain, the endorphins, the dopamine, the acetylcholine. So, you know, maybe, maybe it can help in dealing with the stress of the colic so the horse can deal with the colic better. Ah, I don't know. Makes sense. You know? Yeah, yeah. So the Dante, the very first horse I ever put on pads, um, a couple of years later, oh, I think it was, yeah, maybe three years later, I ran into the owner and she was like, he was colicking one day and she tried, you know, the homeopathics and, and rescue remedy. And then she finally moved up to Banamine and she called the vet, but he wasn't getting better. And she was like, well, I'll just stick him on the pads, Who can, you know, and just see what happens. So she put him on pads and he burped and then he was fine. And he really? Was all yeah. <laughs> wow. I know. It's like, it's, yeah. Um, and then I have a, a horse in Germany. The woman sent me a picture, and the horse is standing there grazing, standing on the on the physio pad. And I'm like, yo, so what's the big deal? Then she sent me the horse pictures of the horse just a few minutes before. It was on its back. Its legs were contracted. Its lips were curled back. It literally looked dead. And she wow. said an, another horse bit it and got it up, and then they stuck it on the physio pad. And she calls it the emergency pad now. And the horse wound up grazing. I mean, it's just really bizarre so what was what was the problem with the horse that it was down like that um i it had i i no i wish you had i can't remember mm, okay <laughs> um <laughs> i have to go back and, and look but it, there was something and the vet didn't even think it was gonna survive but you know i mean this other horse helped get it up and uh -huh. um you know the next thing she sends me this picture and the horse is grazing and it's just fine which wow. was like yeah really Incredible wild quick thinking on her part yeah. So, you know, I keep going back to the, the foot of the horse has all these receptors. The hoof right. is a sensory organ. And we can't even begin to um, recognize all the different things that we're probably hitting, um, if, you know, coming through the foot. And so we do all this training of the horse. We do all this body work, making sure the saddle and everything fits, which is all good. But that foot and how that foot meets the ground really is important to giving the proper feedback to the brain about where that body is in space. Sure. And, and you know, I, I – oh, maybe you were at um, uh, the expo that I had in, in Pennsylvania. And um, I was supposed to be doing a jumping demo, and this kid comes in on this lovely gray pony, but he's totally t upset, and he's rearing. 
And so I, I had the kid get off and I took the horse and I walked him out in front of the audience and I picked up a pad and I tapped it next to his foot just to see how he was going to react. And he's still hollering for his friends and very distracted. And I picked up his foot and I set it on the pad and he instantly reared. I mean, he wasn't on it a second and he popped right up. I walked a 10 meter circle. I came back, I picked up his foot again. I put it on the pad, pushed himself sideways. So again, maybe he was on the pad for a second. Maybe two. I doubt it. Walked him in a circle, came back, picked up the foot again, put it on the pad, dropped his neck. So that was like three 10 meter circles. Wow. Um, I then walked him off and came back and did it again. He not only dropped his neck, he took his muzzle and he started pushing on the dirt like grazing, like literally grazing. And mm. um, so in a, in a what? Under three minutes, this horse went from rearing to grazing. Now, I've asked people about that reaction because it was so strong and so, um, you know, like clear. Right, and um, right. doc, Dr. Stephen Peters, do you know who Dr. Peters is? Uh, yes, yes. Right. He wrote Evidence-Based Horsemanship with Martin Black. Mm -hmm. He's a neuropsychologist for people. And um, way back in the beginning, I spent eight hours at his house with his horses, putting them on short foot pads. And he said he saw a breathing change in under 10 seconds, and he was totally blown away by the process. So when this happened with this rearing horse, I called him up and I said, Stephen, what do you think's happening? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, thanks, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the help. You're the one who's supposed to help me. Right? <laughs> um, so I went to Joyce Herman and I was like, what do you, what do you think's going on? And, and she actually gave me a, a really plausible explanation. And that is that when a horse is grazing on really good grass, the ground has to have a certain texture. It has to probably has a certain of springiness or sure. give to it that tells the horse this is really good grass. And and our guess is that the pad in some way simulated what that ground would be like and triggered the grazing response. That's very interesting. And that makes perfect sense because the quality of the soil would be very different in order for the quality of the grass to be better. Right. You're not going to have, you know, in, in a desert or on a, on a gravel pit, you're not going to have lush, healthy, great, you know, nutritious grass. Yep. Huh. So that actually makes a lot of sense to me. And I've seen it uh, on more than one occasion where the horse went from very anxious to literally, you know, wandering around in an arena where it's been many, many times. It's totally dirt, but it is literally going up to each post and looking for grass, you know, taking the muzzle and moving the dirt around and, you know, very strong grazing response. That's so, very interesting. Yeah. So that that makes sense to me. Um uh, I you know I can't come up with much else. <laughs> right. Well, we're, we're um, going to roll with that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's talking about the receptors in the hoof. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned three receptors. You mentioned the Ruffini receptors. Is that right? Yep. Yep. The was it the Buffinian? Puffinian. Puffinian. Okay. P a c i n i a n. Okay. And the then the proprioceptors. Um, and then you, you were, it sounded like you were saying the Ruffini receptors are in the sole of the foot. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I have this picture in my head of the, of, the uh, uh, image that Dr. Bowker has, and he had drew, um, had a cross section of a foot and had drawn lines where these different receptors were. And the Ruffini receptors are more along the sole, the Piscinian are more toward the heel. And, um, don't quote me on this, it's late at night, but um, there are some receptors that are fast receptors, like they'll, they'll sense the strike of the foot, and then others are slower receptors, and I think the Ruffini are the ones that are slower receptors. So as the horse stands on the pad and the pad starts coming and pressing up into the sole of the foot, you're going to start getting those receptors firing. Gotcha. Um Proprioceptors are, you have them in your joints. We have a lot of proprioceptors in our ankles and, and the joints. They help us orient in space. Um, there's a great story about Catherine Wyckoff. She went down to UT Tennessee. Um, Dr. Stephen Adair is down there, and he has the equine physical therapy uh, course. And he has a physical therapy center down there 
with every cool toy you can possibly think of. I mean, barometric chambers and swimming pools and lameness locators and, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful facility. And Catherine went down there to um, finish up her equine physical therapy program with him. And um, when she got there, he said, you know, I've heard about this thing called Surefoot. And she's like, oh, well, I know about Surefoot. Would you like a demonstration? I just happen to have my pads in the car because she didn't clean out her car. And he's like, yeah, that'd be great. So there was a horse there at the facility. And when you would pick up the right front foot and set it down, it always crossed the left front foot. So it didn't go straight down. Mm. And their physical therapist looked at it. Dr. Derrida looked at it. And they had a professor from Colorado State who has a PhD in the equine spine. He looked, everybody looked at this horse. Pick up the right front foot, put it down across the left front. So uh, Catherine said, can I use that horse for my demo? And they said, sure. And so she did the before. She picked up the foot, put it down across the left front foot. She did 10 minutes of sure foot. Just having the horse stand on the pad, go for a walk, and back stand on the pad, go for a walk. At the end of 10 minutes, she picked up the foot and it went straight down. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I I then stopped it at the facility. I was going to a clinic and I stopped and talked to Dr. Adair for about three hours. And, you know, he was like, clearly it's resetting proprioceptors. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and I said to him, you know, what can we do for a study? I'd really like to... And we talked for three hours, and in the end, it's the same thing as with Dr. Clayton and Dr. Bowker. There's, it's not a simple thing to, to control enough of the factors and figure out what is the specific factor that you want to look at as your um, test for what changes. Um, okay. You know, like, it, ideally... You know, it, ideally we'd look at brain chemicals, but then sure. that's so invasive, right? That's uh, like a yeah, really right, difficult right. study, right? Okay. Um, and if we look at movement, you have to control so many factors. You have to control who leads the horse, what the footing is, you know, what the environment is um, for your before and after and your control group. So that the number of horses that you need to come up with an accurate study starts to grow rapidly yeah that would be Um, considerable yeah and so you know we have done a really brief little study at a university i cannot mention the name or i'll have to pay a royalty where (laughs) they have force plates in the ground and we had put horses on the force plates and then put pads underneath the feet and collected data and while we were doing that what we had a lot of vets come through and the thing that everybody noticed was how easy it was to collect the data because the horses were relaxing and so oh sure you know right right yeah like we collected the data super quickly because the horses were standing there and getting more and more relaxed um unfortunately that data has never been analyzed for quite a number of reasons and it's um you know just one of those things but you know so anyway it's not like i haven't continued to try and find a way to quantify this but after doing it for five years, what is so apparent to me is that Surefoot is profound to the horses and it's profound to the owners because their horses change and they become the horses that they want them to be. That, you know, a horse that's comfortable and relaxed and confident and able to learn and move better. And one of the cool things is the horse recognizes who brought them comfort. And, you know, when I'm doing a clinic and putting pads underneath horses' feet, the rider's biggest complaint is that the horses will not go away from me. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Exactly. Like they, well, and it's they... funny because I know um, you've done quite a bit of teaching uh, at Brenda's place up Feather Hill in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, and she makes the comment that that gelding of hers, that you are his absolute favorite person on the planet. <laughs> snip. I love Snip. <laughs> snip, yeah. that's his name, yeah. Yep, yep. Snip. But that's the thing is, you know, like the horses, they they want to come to be with me. I make them comfortable. I make them feel better. And the nice thing is that when the owners do this with their horse, they get that response. They get the same Um, benefit from it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I have people tell me, you know, my my horse never comes up to me in the field. And I did Surefoot. And now he he comes up to me in the field or, you know, he he wants to be with me and he would like me to put him on the path. So it changes that relationship. It transforms, you know, what. And it also helps people understand why the horse is doing what he's doing. In other words, 
you know, if your horse keeps drifting out every day and you're riding when you're trying to ride a 20 meter circle and it keeps drifting to the outside and you think, oh, you know, why is this horse doing this? Well, when you put him on the pads and you see how much he sways to the outside, you start to realize he's not doing this to me. This right. is what is happening. Right. As you start to recognize what's happening, you can start making, uh, uh, you know, a plan for what to do about it and or the surefoot pads may resolve it for you because the horse starts to experience his own balance and make changes in his own body so that he doesn't need to drift out through the shoulder. Right, which then makes changes in their thinking, of course. Right. So then, you know, kind of, you know, I, I talk all the time in my clinics about horses kind of developing a personal philosophy, you know, as it relates to the work they do or to the rider's aids or things like that. So then the, the surefoot is kind of helping them to adjust their philosophy. Yeah, because they physically change their balance. Right. You know, and that's... And so I, it's not I, a case of want to or don't want to. It's more a case of now I can. Correct. Yeah. That's... Because they, they you know, they, they're simple in their thinking in that way. They're not doing this to us to right. make us miserable. It's right. what's happening. Right. And... You mean um, they don't wake up with a checklist of how to piss us off? No. <laughs> oh, so, so I've been thinking of it wrong all these years. Yeah. No, <laughs> no it, it never ceases to amaze me when people seem to have that idea. So. Right. But they, they don't have that type of thinking. They just physically don't have that kind of brain. Right. It's not there. They have a very little frontal lobe. You have to realize horses are motor movement creatures. They have an enormous cerebellum. They are mostly motor function and brain and everything in their life is about movement and so that's one of the reasons i think that this works so rapidly um i think in some cases we're not we're restoring the horse to the, like the original program it's like you know they used to move in a certain way and then they had an insult they had an injury they had a saddle that didn't fit or somebody you know whatever um and now their habit pattern is this new pattern of poor movement but when they stand on the sure foot pads it like resets the system and they get back to the original pattern they get back to what they were born with as opposed to what's happened to them i don't know that's a very so, interesting way of thinking about it yeah what they were born yeah. with instead of what's happened to them wow i like that. yeah yep yeah because you know i mean you, you look at most foals and they're very secure on their feet they can run around they can stop they play um you know most of them are quite curious and then you know things ha it's just like us you know we fall down somebody kicks us in the field and oh now our ribs hurt and then they put a saddle on us and oh it really grabbed the ribs and, oh now i have to hold my breath and the next thing i know they're leaning over and i have to fall through my shoulder but then they're pulling me back and you know <laughs> right sure sure <laughs> And, um, and they don't have the ability to go, hey, you know, if I just square up underneath you, you'll, it'll all be okay. They are totally subject to the, to the effects of gravity and the effect of our body on their back. Um, and, and if they don't feel secure on their feet, if their balance tips a little forward, the next thing you know, they're going or they're falling sideways. And it wasn't their intention at all. It's just what happened. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. It's the place they found themselves in then at that point. Yeah. yeah. And the and the rider because they can't understand how they got there or what happened, then they start to get they get upset because they feel out of balance. Right. And this is you know, I at all my clinics now I put people over the sure foot pads and the first I did this to you at Equine Affair. Yes. You absolutely. Know, the, the first time through I let them go through on their own. And it's like the horse in the field. When you're on your own you can figure out how to negotiate uneven surfaces, right. right? There's no outside influence. So, oh, okay, I didn't predict that it was going to be like that, but I can steady up and I can stand on this thing so I can handle it. But then I come along and I push on you while you're on the unstable surface. And then we see how you react to feeling out of balance and what your habit pattern is to dealing with that. And, and the majority of people, when I push on them, brace against the pad, stiffen the legs, which raises their center of mass and makes them more tippy. And so it takes so little pressure, like on the chest, to push on them and knock them backwards or push on their back and knock them forward because they've stiffened the joints. And 
in a horse, it's pretty much the same way. The rider's on their back, and the rider does something, and their balance shifts, their weight shifts, and the next thing the horse is bracing to try and figure out, oh, I'm starting to fall. When humans feel like they're falling, the first thing they do is put their arms out. You know, to a right. person, your arms go away from your body. <laughs> You're going to start putting limbs out somewhere. You're going to create a brace. Well, when the horse starts to fall, he's going to do the same thing. He's either going to stiffen his neck, raise his head in the air, brace his leg out, do something to try and save himself. We take that as a sign of resistance or a sure. sign of, sure. you know, being um, spoiled or not, you know, behaving. And really, it's if anybody, if you ever had anybody put a halter on your head and hang onto that rope, I think you'd think a little differently about what it's like to be the horse with somebody controlling your head. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, and so we don't think about the fact that, you know, here's this big, massive body, and the only thing it has to stabilize on it was four little feet. And and it's amazing that they do. You know, like, I just got back from Africa where I take people on horseback safari, and we rode across the open plains, and we, you know, hand gallop and gallop. And there's rocks and holes and whatever, and these horses are so sure-footed you know they'll run across that open plane they'll carry you you know it's a different rider every every safari and they get their feet out you know and they stay upright and and it's amazing so i think we so underestimate what that horse is doing when he carries us on his back i just it's an amazing thing and then we go over big jumps and you know go at speed and right. sharp corners and sure. you know gymkhana and barrel racing and and all you know cattle and 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 never stop to think what a phenomenal um uh, amazing organization neurological organization to keep everything going in the right place so that the horse remains standing remains underneath us yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, you're right. We don't we don't think about that. We think, well, you know, he ought to be able to do that because that's just what he does. We don't take into consideration the fact that now we've got the weight of the rider and the tack and the balance or lack of balance of the rider right. and the tack on top of the horse that's going to, of course, be influencing those four little feet that he has underneath him. Yeah. And then we get back to that, that wheel that I'm talking about with you know, if the teeth are out of balance, mm, yeah. that's going to affect the feet. If the saddle's pinching him, it's like you with a tight pair of shoes, you're going to start moving funny. You know, if you don't feel good and, you know, you have uh, a metabolic problem or, you know, you got Lyme disease and you don't feel good, um, you know, you're not going to move well. You're not going to be happy in your work. So, you know, it's this holistic perspective of the different things that we need to be responsible for. And in the end, how can we help that horse feel really good in himself, really secure in himself, really confident because he knows that he can hold his ground and he can use the ground to move Yeah, and that, feel the ground. Right, and know? feel the ground and feel the ground. How he feels about himself, I like that you say that. That reminds me very much of what uh, my friend Tom Curtin says at a lot of his clinics. And, of course, he's talking about horsemanship. He's not talking about surefoot. Uh, I, well, I don't know if he knows anything yet about uh, surefoot. But um, the line that he says is, it doesn't matter what I think of your horsemanship, and it doesn't even really matter what you think of your horsemanship. <laughs> What's most important is how your horse feels about himself when he's with you. Yeah. And yeah. that would very much, to me, explain why the horses start looking at their owners differently when they start, you know, uh, utilizing the surefoot system and things like that. And it's, you know, to me, it goes back to what you said uh, early on in the discussion that they're waiting for us to say something in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because I've worked with so many horses and, um, you know, they don't know me when I walk up to them and I walk up to them with this funny little pad and, <laughs> and so many of them, and in Europe, I had a really tough bunch of horses. Um, they had, this woman got in a bunch of horses that had been, you know, just through the mill, but they typically, they'll just slightly turn their head away and, and just not look at me. And I never try, you know, like, we're like, well, pay attention. You know, we want to pull the horse's head right, around. Right, exactly. And, and, you know, what this horse is doing, in my opinion, is he's telling me, look, uh, please don't, you know, uh, are you a threat? Please don't hurt me. 
I'm right. just going to look over here and do my calming signals so that you don't think that I'm threatening to you. Yep, I'm just going to go inside myself. Yep, yep I'm just going to, you know. And so I start with the pad, and I put their foot on the pad, and some of them stand on it for a half a second. Some of them stand on it for a couple of seconds. Some of them don't, you know, whatever, I, whatever the horse does. And I just let them move off. And I'll come back, and I just do this a few times. And typically within two or three times, the next thing, they're turning their head, and they're looking at me, and then they take their whiskers, and they just very gently take their whiskers, and they kind of waffle my hand or my wrist, or they might come up to my cheek. And and to me, what that is happening in that moment is the release of a chem neurochemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical of bonding. Mm. It's the one, you know, it, some people call it the chemical of love. Um, okay. It's the one that, you know, women, uh, when they give birth, they have a huge rush of oxytocin. So they bond with the baby so that there's this strong connection so that you nurture that baby. So in sheep, well, the first time a sheep gives birth to a lamb, there's no oxy big burst of oxytocin. But the second lamb, there's a huge burst so that they separate from the first lamb and bond to their new lamb. So oh. when I see horses do this, to me, it's like they're going, oh, you're okay. You're, you're uh, you know, a part of my herd. You're doing something nice to me. And it's so evident that that's you know they're suddenly interacting they're engaging me they're going who are you you know wow that was kind of you did something nice <laughs> yeah you know and it and it's very very clear and horses that have had more trauma or, or like i just had one today um somebody's gotten a new horse and he's been a school horse and he's rather shut down and you know i did a little with the pads yesterday and he was like okay i'm not gonna even let you know anything and then today he's, you know he's starting to look around his ears start to come up and he just once came over and just touched me with his whiskers and um you know i don't think anybody's really ever done anything nice to this horse they've just used mm -hmm. him like an off-road vehicle yeah um but when I, when I see that, to me, that's like, yeah, I did something that was meaningful to you, that interacted with you in a way that felt, you know, like you want to interact with me now. You want to check me out because I did something that really made you feel good. Right. And, um, I mean, I'll get horses that are, I'll, I'll never forget, I had one, and it, the first day, it just pawed and pawed and pawed and pawed, and I just held onto the leg and you know, I, you have to be careful with those kind of horses to keep your shoulder really loose so that they, you know, or let go. Mm -hmm. um, and I just rode with it. Maybe the foot hit the pad. Maybe it didn't. Maybe it kicked it out of the way. Maybe it didn't. Maybe he stood on it for a couple of seconds. Maybe it didn't. And I, you know, I worked with him, let him go off for a walk, came back and did that a few times. And next day, horse came out, put him on the pad, stood on the pad, went to sleep. Boom. <laughs> wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Like all the fooling around, all yeah. that behavior completely stopped. Hmm. So, well, it's, and, it's just and that's brilliant. when you know when we've got the horses in this different state, when they're starting to relax onto the pads, when they're you know nudging with the whiskers, when they're becoming yes, not curious. nudging, it's just feeling. They're not feeling. Nudging. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, so when they're doing that and, and when they're going through a lot of these other postures and positions that we're talking about, this is when we're beginning then, am I correct, to access then the parasympathetic system? Oh, for sure. I mean, the, so the sympathetic is the fight and flight. Yeah. Head comes up, you know, the get ready to go. Right. Um, parasympathetic, rest and digest. So you'll see the neck lowering, the eyes softening, the ears softening, breathing changes, everything that's taking that horse into what's called a homeostatic state is the resting state. The, the, the state, if you, if you watch horses out in the field, they spend the majority of their time just kind of hanging out. Um, that's what they're designed to do is to just hang out the majority of the time. You'll see them play, but Really, in nature, the flight reflex is only triggered for super brief periods of time. Um, and again, I go back to the fact that I just came back from Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we rode in the Maasai Mara. It's a horseback safari. By the way, we're going back next September. Um, that's awesome. And we're definitely going to get to talking about that here in a few minutes, too. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's what we talk about in the next podcast so that we can make that the topic. Um, but because, you know, we've been talking about Surefoot so much. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, 
we're out there and I have watched packs of hyena walk through herds of grazing animals. Um, I've watched lions laying there, you know, and they'll, you know, horses ride by and they just look when they're not hungry. They're, they're not hungry. They're not going to hunt. Right. So, I mean, I have my favorite photograph from this safari is a, a male giraffe at the reaching up to a tree at the full extent of his neck with his tail tongue extended, which they have black tongues. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. And a hyena, not 10 feet from his feet, staring at my camera. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Like the giraffe is completely ignoring the hyena. He's grazing way up at the top of the tree. And so, you know, the, what you realize is that for the most most of the time out there, it is not this predator prey thing. People aren't, you yeah. know, animals aren't constantly hunting and there isn't this stress. They're out there grazing. They're grazing. They're sleeping. You know, they're migrating. Um, and then, you know, the predator gets hungry and starts to hunt. And in that moment, that's there's a stress. Yes, sure. And it's a super short period of time. Because these cats can't run for long distances. They can't hunt for hours and hours now. They, right, they can't short, go all day long doing that. Yeah. Right. They're short bursts. So we actually found these four lionesses, and they were – we knew that they were uh, – the way they were looking, they were starting to think about dinner. And so they moved across this little um, dry riverbank, and there were some um, wildebeest. And it was starting to rain, and our guide said – if it rains, what they'll do is the the wildebeest will turn their butt to the rain, and that's the time the lion that'll attack. Mm. So they will wait for them. And so it started to rain, and the wildebeest kind of started to gather and start to turn their butts. And then a hyena walked past the wildebeest, and the wildebeest went, oh, hyena, and they moved off. <laughs> and they just wandered off a little bit. Uh, and the lion wow. were like, oh, well, that, that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, oh, a dress. <laughs> Foiled again. <laughs> yep, and they just wandered off, and the wildebeest never even knew the lion were there. I mean, you know, well, and yeah. if they turned their backs to the rain, they would have never seen the lion. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. you know. well, and I like how uh, Dr. Robert Miller of the imprint training fame uh, says it. You know, he says horses aren't afraid of predators as much as they're afraid of predatory behavior. Oh, yeah. You know, which which makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah, absolutely, because, you know, when when they sense that somebody's hunting, oh, then you can see them going, uh-oh, yep. all right, who's yep. who's being hunted? And then the guys that aren't being hunted, they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just go over here because we're okay. <laughs> it's kind of like catching horses in a pasture, right? The one that doesn't yeah. want to be caught knows that you're talking to him and all the rest know you're not trying to catch not them. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think. And so, you know, that's the thing is, even if, you, you know, people want to say we're the predator, but I always say we're the pink squishy thing without fur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Here we go. Making me think about readjusting my diet again. No, I'm the yeah, pink squishy thing. You know, Damn it. But, uh, <laughs> but, that, but that's the thing is we, we're, we're so vulnerable. And when you're out there on safari, you realize how vulnerable you are. You yeah. know, it's like, um, you know, we cross the river with the hippo and it's like, don't drift, don't drift, stay on your line. Oh, um, yeah, because, you know, we're, we're incredibly vulnerable. And the, and the thing that makes us not so vulnerable is actually the tools that we have around us, not us physically. Sure. Like, absolutely. You know, so we have this false sense of, uh, in my opinion, of being at the top of the food chain. It's it's because we have the ability to create tools that put us there. The, but in yeah. our innate self, you know, we're we're the pink squishy thing that they're like, wait, that's right. an easy one. <laughs> right. Um, and th- it's um, I, I want my horse to see me as someone there to help him rather than someone there to harm him you know if a good leader doesn't need to always be asserting their power a good leader leads because they are people will follow a good leader because that that's who they are yeah um and and i find that you know like the horses want to follow me because I've done something nice to them. And the more in balance I help them find that good balance, 
the, they're not pushy, they don't shove, they're not falling, they're not rude, because I've made them feel comfortable right. and shown them how to be in balance in their own body. And then they can just chill. You know, they're like, oh, whew, that feels better. Right. Well, I think they innately recognize the difference when someone's trying to do something with them or for them versus someone who's trying to do something kind of to them or at them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty awesome. So uh, I know in your DVD, you have a DVD um, yep. on the use of the short foot pad. And I found that one to be pretty fascinating. I particularly liked the, I believe it was a mare that was recovering or had recovered from Lyme. Oh, that was Moon Pie. Moon yep. Pie. Okay. okay. I'm so terrible so, with names of people that's okay. and horses. So, so. Um, what we've done is we made a new DVD to go with the new pads. And okay. Moon Pie is now on YouTube in the before and after. So if you ah, go on the nice. Murdoch Method YouTube channel, we've got two webinars up there that you can see me work with different horses. Um, one of them is a three-year-old and he was really nervous and I wanted people to see what happened. We had a lightning strike just outside the arena a minute before we went live for that webinar. Oh, no. so, yeah, so it was great because he was really nervous. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, because the, the there's a false sense of security when you see horses, the horses stand on the pads and fall asleep, um, you tend to, think that it's always going to go that way and there are some horses that um when you oh thank you when you um you know uh put them on a pad they push on it and they get oh, somebody just brought me a blanket because i've been sitting outside in this lovely evening but it got chilly oh. <laughs> how sweet uh, and i'm just yeah, going to keep I... you out there talking and freezing <laughs> yeah but it's such a nice night and it's been so hot that i'm really enjoying it yes um, but anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Um, you know, it can look super easy. It can be very deceptive and you always want to approach the horse, especially the first time, let the horse observe, you know, drop the pad on the ground, watch his reaction before you pick up a foot, you know, make sure you don't force the horse to stay because then he's going to be more anxious if, if he steps on this thing and he's not sure about it. So, um, on those webinars, they're on my YouTube channel. It, you can see me working with different horses to see that it's, you know, the, the bell curve. The typical sure. horse is puts a foot on the pad and they're like, yay, this is great. But you have those outliers and it's always important to know when the first time you walk up to a horse to be really careful um, and just watch his reactions before you put his foot on a pad. Right, right, absolutely. But, the Moon Pie Before and After, that's up on my YouTube channel. That's still my absolutely favorite, favorite horse. Yeah. She was amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that the one titled um, Equine Stability Program DVD clip? Does that sound right? Um, I, I just, know, you I just my... shared one of those um, for everybody okay. watching and listening. Uh, I just shared the one there that, uh, that popped up. And if nothing else, that's going to give everybody a link to uh, seeing more of the clips that you have on there. Uh, yeah. How... I have a bunch of quick start clips. And, okay. And I, I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know the title, I, whether it says before and after or what. But, yeah, if they just go to the YouTube channel and start looking through, and there's some other video clips up there um, they might find enjoyable. So Perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah. How else can people find out more about the Surefoot Stability Program? Um, you can go to the Murdoch Method page on Facebook. We regularly post stories. There's also Surefoot Equine on Facebook. Um, at some point, I'm going to put those together just in one page, but you can still go to Surefoot Equine on Facebook. Okay. You can go to the Murdoch Method website, and there's a section on Surefoot. And if you go to Surefoot Equine uh, in the store, we have fact sheets on all the different products um, so that you can read about, you know, how they, they differ. But the YouTube channel, really, t I talk about the different pads and how to get started with your horse. So there's just a tremendous amount of information out there. And I'm going to keep uploading uh, more video. In fact, um, I'm a little behind on that. But I'll just keep, keep putting up more video clips on the YouTube channel. So if you subscribe, when I put up a new video clip you'll get i think you get a notice and you can check it out yes yes in fact i know i'm subscribed and so i do get a, a notice every time you post 
um, new videos. Uh, so. Oh, and I've got to put this post up from our safari because, <laughs> and I'll put it up on there on my Murdoch Method page. But we were we went out in the vehicles one evening and we came across this dry ravine and there were these three elephants grazing in the dry ravine. They were chewing on a tree, really? and this one younger bull. He was, you know, he's a few. Oh, he's probably about ten years older, maybe a little older. He comes up out of the ravine, and so the truck in front of us starts the engine to move off a little bit, and he just pulls a little bit forward. And this elephant's like, "What are you doing?" And he puts his ears out, and then he trumpets at the truck. Oh is, no! Yeah, it was great, and I got it all on video. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. It was really great. So that was. So I got to put that one up. I I really need to get that up there. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's definitely an experience not many get to have. I love that. Well, we're going back next September, the 8th through 16th. Um, the reason we're going back next year is because um, the past two times we've gone, it's been on the same year as Equitana in Germany. So that's, um, you know, I'm gone a month in March and then a month in September. So um, gotcha. what we decided to do was put in a safari in September so that we can then go every other year and get it off cycle to Equitana. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Yep. But it's, you know, it's just an incredible experience. And um, if, if anybody has that on their bucket list, um, you know, going on horseback safari to, to the Masai Mara, the game is absolutely amazing. There's, I don't think there's any place in Africa like the Mara in terms of just the sheer number of game. Like on the last day, we went out and I have video of a cheetah and photographs of this cheetah. I, I put that up as my po my picture. I, I was just going to ask. Picture. That's the new profile photo, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just so amazing to watch her. And she came across and took a drink of water and then went and laid under a tree. And um, it's really magical out there. It's really incredible. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Now, and then, you have information on the safari on your website as well, don't you? I, I do. We haven't put up the 2018 information, but it's pretty much um, the same as the 2017, uh, I'm pretty sure. And we'll be getting up that information. But if anybody's interested in joining us on safari, it's a limited number of riders. So please, you know, they can get in touch with me. They can email me at wendy at wendymurdoch.com or message me through Facebook and um because we were already signing people up now. We've already got people interested, and so I think it's going to fill pretty quickly. Oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's it's uh, great to me, your safaris and, and you talking about the um, Safari Equitana. Last time we got a chance to visit uh, in person together, I thought that was so great, and you've you actually kind of spurred – uh, my interest in doing something like that. So we're planning um, in February. We're going to Portugal. Uh, I'm actually yeah, going to Portugal yeah, for I saw five that. weeks, and we're taking a couple groups of riders with us there, also. So, so you're going uh, for five weeks. I'm I'm a princess, so I'm going to be going for a little longer. Yeah, I figure in five weeks, maybe they can teach me a little bit about how to ride. Uh, oh, so <laughs> I need. <laughs> you know, I need all the help I can get. So. <laughs> But, yeah, so we have uh, two groups each going with us for 10 days at a time. Um, so we'll be we'll be riding, uh, and then we'll have a couple days that we'll be just kind of playing tourist and visiting around Lisbon. So Awesome. Uh, yeah, That's so a, you've, you've inspired me for that. Yeah, I'm going, if I wasn't going somewhere else in February, um, I'm going down to Costa Rica, actually. Um, oh, are you? Very cool. Going, yeah, I, I, I looked at your trip. I was like, oh, that would be fun. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, next year. Next year. And one of these years, I will be going on safari with you. I can't wait for that. That's going to be awesome. so much fun. Awesome. That's definitely a bucket list thing for me, for sure. Yeah. For sure. yeah. So, it's, and it's I love really your idea is. about uh, chatting more in our next broadcast together and talking solely about safari. But can you give our listeners maybe just one of your favorite memories? Oh, wow. Um, well... So I've been going to Kenya for, this was my seventh trip, and I always wanted to go across the Mara River on horseback. And so finally this year, uh, the stars aligned. We have had other trips where the, we were supposed to cross the river, and it poured down rain, and the river came up so high we couldn't get across and things like that. But the stars aligned this year. We had a great group of people, and we swam across the Mara River. And what you need to realize is when you swim across the Mara River, there are hippos and crocodiles. So we did not see any crocodiles. Oh, that's all, just hippos and crocodiles. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, just things like that. 
Yeah, we didn't have any crocodiles. We didn't even see any where we crossed. I don't think I would but be as worried about the crocodiles as I am about the hippo. The hippos. Well, Gordy did have to go down with his, his uh, stock whip and crack it a few times to just move them down the river a bit more. But um, the, when we swam across, we have the loose horse, and the loose horse started to drift down into where the hippos were. So Gordy's like, stay on my line. I'm like, okay, I'm right behind you, Gordy, because I take my camera, and I turn around, and I take pictures of everybody while we're swimming across, okay? So um, one person, her horse started to follow the loose horse and was drifting down toward the hippos. We're all getting our uh. get up there. <laughs> but we got across, and of course, we, we go after we go across the river, we go up into the Mara Triangle, and up the escarpment, and it's at 6,000 feet, and from the top of the escarpment, you look out across the Mara and the reserve, and it's stunning. It's just amazing. Oh, wow. Um, yep. And so, you know, I mean, I've, I've gone there seven times now, and I keep seeing new things, things I haven't seen before. The, you know, it's an ever-changing environment because – like this year, the rains failed, so the grasses were quite different. And I saw a game that I'd never seen. And um, their their the migration is always in a different place when you're there. And but it's it's always just an amazing experience, and the, it's a magical place. So wow, we're looking forward. <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting a jacket. Now. <laughs> we're almost done. <laughs> My my hostess always takes very good care of me. Oh, and fantastic! <laughs> yep, yep. So, oh goodness! So, yeah, well, I don't want you, know, you to freeze out there. So, yeah. <laughs> so yep. uh, we can kind of get into our wrap up then, I suppose, if you're ready, because I, I don't want you to freeze. Okay. Because then we won't have that next conversation about yeah, the no. safari, and that's pretty safari important. Safari and questions, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, yep. so now you've already encountered these wrap-up questions. I'm going to change the first one a little bit just to fit more the theme of the, uh, the discussion that we've had about Shorefoot. Uh, so if there was one specific thing, Wendy, that you'd recommend that riders could focus on as a primary means of improving – their relationship with their horse, what would that be? It, um, to take the time to, be, to observe. Mm. We're so quick to react. And, and, it, and if we just stop for a moment and really take the time to observe and just really see what's in front of us, I think. I think we're all so busy in our in our world and we're always, you know, rushing in a hurry and having tasks and goals. Sometimes just just sitting there and like, you know, I'm thinking about this little horse I saw yesterday and I was just looking at his face and all of a sudden I realized that the two sides of his face were so different that his his eyes were set at completely different angles mm -hmm. and just the whole line of his face and and I found it fascinating. That, it, uh, you know, I walked past this horse and been with this horse for, I don't know, an hour or so. And suddenly I just stopped and looked. And it was right there all the time. Hmm. You know? So actually that, be there. Yeah. Be there and really get present in the observation without judgment. I like it. Uh, I think the without judgment is probably the hardest part for people. Yeah. Because we've always got sure. an agenda, right? We've got yeah. something we need to do. We've got something that we're thinking. We've got presuppositions about what everything means. And this is what I find so often with the horses is that we presuppose what's going on. We're yeah. not really in the moment observing, like like I said, without judgment and just really going, you know, objectively, this this is what's what's in front of me right now. This is how he's standing on his foot. This is what his face looks like. And just really being present with that. With, Yeah. Wow. I like it. I like it a lot. So, and I know you've you've had these couple questions, these next couple questions in the past, but I don't remember what your answers were. So you could give me totally I, I different answers question, and that so. would be all good. Uh, <laughs> Um, and for anybody who wants to, you know, recount Wendy's last answers and see what she said in the last broadcast and compare, that was episode three of Talking About Ooh, Horses. Wait. 
Um, and so now here we are 10 episodes later. I think that's great. Um, so if you could ride with anyone, past or present, oh. who would it be and why? Uh, Jean St. Fort Payard. I'm pretty sure that was the answer you gave last time. Last I, time I, I remember the name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're still, consistent. Well, that's good. That's um, good. Because I just, I love his book and he's not alive anymore, but I would, he's a guy I would just love to sit down and have a conversation with. Um, and, and if there, uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah, actually, and you know who else I would really, it just, so, so I'm going to tell a little story here, but, um, my mom's moved in with me and mm -hmm. we sold her house. And so in the process, I, all the family photos came down and, my dad had taken all these slides. Um, and so I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do with this slide? So I got a slide scanner, like a big one, and it can scan five slides at a time. And I was sitting there just um, in July scanning in some slides because I had – like I had downtime, right? <laughs> sure, yeah, you know. <laughs> I got gotcha. and, and I came across the slide that I don't actually ever remember my father taking – and it was taken where I rode when I was a kid and I was 11 to 11 to 14. I took lessons at a place called Old Orchard Stables in Stamford, Connecticut with a man named Mr. Davies. Mr. Davies had a horse named Honey and I loved Honey. And I have this, this slide that I didn't even know existed where I am on Honey giving her a great big hug. And Aww. Mr. Davies had taken a, like a, a chin strap and tied up the snaffle bit over the bridge of the horse's nose. And I, I, don't, I don't remember this as a kid, but I looked at that and I was like, that man was so smart because what he did by taking the, the chin strap and going over the nose is he prevented that bit from being pulled down onto the lower jaw. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so he had done this and, you know, like to make sure that the horses never had their mouths pulled on too hard by kids. Wow. And, you know, he was an old Welshman and he, you know, I mean, he he had a barn where all the horses would walk down the barn aisle to get a drink of water twice a day because they didn't have buckets of water in their stall. They had a trough at the end of the aisle. And um, that's where I really started taking riding lessons and so that's i would actually like to go back and see mr davies hmm. that would be great that would be yeah. great okay next question what is your present personal definition of horsemanship oh um how do i how do i define this um, because what comes to mind so clearly is that we need to be continually the student and continually being open to learning and to observing and to um, not prejudge what's in front of us, but to each time we're with a horse, look at that horse and figure out what, what does that horse need? What can I do to make that horse feel more comfortable to work with me rather than impose what I think that horse needs on that horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. That kind of reminds me of something that Ray used to say to us all the time. Ray Hunt, uh, he would say, you know, the human has a lot of opinions, but the horse mm -hmm. is a fact. Yeah. 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 And such a mirror. And I know that he yeah. used to talk about that too. Yeah, um, and so you get to look and see how, how are you, you know, how am I today? Um, in the reflection of that horse. Right. Right. I love it. Okay, one more time. How can folks find you? Um, they can go to MurdochMethod.com. They can go to my Facebook page, Murdoch Method. YouTube channel is also Murdoch Method. Um, and, you know, people are, feel free to email me at Wendy at WendyMurdoch.com. And, of course, Murdoch is spelled M-U-R-D-O-C-H.com. Perfect. Perfect. All right. And... You know this part was coming up, I'm sure, 
every broadcast, uh, every video I do, we have a question of the day. And when we have guests, the guest gets to ask the question of the day. Any question for our listeners to answer. What's our question of the day? The question of the day is, what new thing have you observed in your horse today that you did not notice yesterday? Ooh, nice, nice. All right, gang, give us your answers for the question of the day in the comment section of this audio. We look forward to hearing your answers. Wendy, thank you once again for yet another fantastic broadcast. Oh, you're welcome. These are so much fun, Patrick. I'm These so glad you're doing this. Fun. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And gang, I want to thank you so much for tuning in for episode number 13 of Talking About Horses. I really appreciate you giving Wendy and I your ear. Please remember, if you've missed any of this, you can access the full broadcast here through Facebook, through YouTube, or by streaming it directly from iTunes. Through whatever outlet you're listening, please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share. Your word of mouth is our fuel for this fire. And be sure to tune in next week for my interview with Miss Mary Miller-Jordan.